I'm journalist and editor Hugo Lindgren. I'm here at the Intelligence Squared podcast with Scott Anderson, who's the author of a new book, The Quiet Americans, Four CIA Spies in the Dawn Cold War, A Tragedy in Three Acts. If you're watching this on YouTube, please support Intelligence Squared by liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Just click on the subscribe button below, uh, below, below there. Um, and if today's topic is something you have strong views on, let us know what you think in the comment section. And be nice, please. Um, so Scott, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell uh, the audience a little bit about you if they haven't bought your book yet, which they obviously should do immediately. Um, Scott is a veteran foreign, foreign correspondent and a war reporter. Um, he's worked for many places, including the New York Times Magazine, where we knew each other a little bit a few years ago. Um, his last book was Lawrence in Arabia about T.E. Lawrence, the infamous British intelligence officer. Um, and Scott, why don't we just start with a super basic question, kind of bring everybody up to speed, including some who might not be familiar with the book yet. Um, it's about the underpinnings of the United States sort of modern intelligence apparatus starting in and around World War II. Could you give us a quick overview of the ground you cover in the book? Yeah, I, I, fo I focus in on essentially a 12 year period from 1944 towards the end of the World War II uh, through to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. And I, I chose this period um, because in 1944, FDR was still president, and he was talking about what, what was going to be the end of World War II, was, meant the end of the European colonial empires, the British and the French. They were causing so much disenchantment and rebellion throughout the developing world. And that also the United States was going to be this kind of uh, beacon of democracy. It was, it was going to export democracy around the world. And he had this idea of the United Nations was going to be this transnational problem-solving agency. Uh, fast forward to 12 years later, and by 1956, the United States is now actually bankrolling the British and French empires around the world in, in their fighting in insurgencies against communism in, in Asia and, uh, and, and in Europe, uh, Africa. Um, and America is now overthrowing, uh, rather than spreading democracy, we're actually overthrowing democratic regimes in, in Iran and Guatemala. So I, I saw this this kind of 12 year period of the beginning of the Cold War as, as really the, the kind of solidified everything that was to come over, over the next 35 year history of, of the Cold War. Now let's, I want to ask a really basic question is why does FDR's vision not outlive him? I mean, it, it sounds, you know, very consistent with where the country was coming out of World War II, this, you know, sort of heroic war, at least from the, from the, from the perspective of the United States. Uh, liberating Europe from fascism. Uh, what's the what's the reason? What's where, where's the switch? I think, in a nutshell, it was that the, the American people in general, but especially Truman, when he comes in in, in April of 1945, the war was the war was over. World War II was over. Um, uh, the Americans were demobilizing at the rate of 15,000 soldiers a day, just coming coming home, whereas the Soviets they kind of saw World War II as round one. <laughs> and now right. round two <laughs> is the West. And so very quickly, they, uh, the Soviets, they had, they had conquered or liberated Eastern Europe, um, depending on one's perspective. They very quickly solidified those countries as part of this, the Soviet bloc. And so there's this very critical kind of two-year period where, to my mind, Truman and, and American foreign policy in general was kind of asleep at the wheel. They, the focus was domestic, and they were they really weren't paying attention to what was happening around the world, and and the, the kind of solidification of, of communist governments uh, throughout, especially in Eastern Europe. So, do you throw a lot of that on Truman? I mean, your portrait of him is not uh, not very generous. Um, right. uh, is that is is that a big piece of it? His general sort of lack of qualifications for the job, his lack of worldliness, is that a big piece of it? I, I, to my mind, yes. I, I mean, I think that if you look at sort of turning points of American history, that one particularly tragic crossroads was Roosevelt dying when he did. Um, he, uh, he, you know, it's, it's one of the great, great what ifs. What, you know, what if in the post-war era, uh, Roosevelt had been there, had he, would he have been able to deal with Stalin in a way that Truman just did not? I, I, I really feel that Truman was, it was kind of a deer in headlights. And partly this is Roosevelt's fault too, because Truman was kept completely in the dark 
Uh, right. People around Roosevelt knew he was really ill uh, and frankly dying for the, the last, certainly the last eight months of, before he died. And no effort was made to bring Truman on board to g give him any sense of what was going on. Truman didn't know about the atomic bomb being developed, you know, for example, until the day after he became president. So I think Truman was really, he really was just kind of at sea in, the, in this really crucial, crucial point. You described this pretty interesting moment with Truman where, he, I, I don't know if it was his first meeting with Stalin, but one of the early ones in any case, and he, he's sort of impressed by him and has this kind of almost Trump-like kind of like gut reaction to him that he's like a man he can trust or something. Can right. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was, it was, it was their very first meeting. It was at Potsdam, the Potsdam conference in, right in, in August of 1945. So the war is just, the war is still going on in, 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 in Japan. It's just ended in Europe. And, and, uh, and Truman met Stalin for the first time. And he wrote in his, in his personal diary, um, uh, Stalin is honest. He, he's smart as hell, but I can deal with him. So in, in kind of like 12 words, kind of got three things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that old sort of folksy, folksy gut instinct. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in the early days, in the early post-war era, as... as um, as the, the Soviets kind of building up its military presence in, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, the United States is retracting the sort of intelligence operations kind of stepping into the breach in a sense. W what's the goal? What's the aim? Like what do the, what do these, these sort of young men who are charged with, with running uh, these intelligence operations, what, what are they trying to do? It's a great question. I, I think they didn't really have clear direction. And it, you know, one of the and one of the characters in my book, uh, Peter Sichel, um, and this really shows you just how clueless the Americans were. Of you know, the Soviets were very clear of what the new conflict was, and I, there was a tremendous element of wishful thinking on the Americans' part that somehow the wartime alliance with the Soviet Union will, will continue in the post-war. So Peter Sichel is is uh, sent to Berlin. Uh, in in the fall of 1945, so the war is just over. He's put in charge of the first covert operations unit, a clandestine unit of, of the American military in Berlin. Berlin now is like ground zero of the coming Cold War. Um, so at that time, there's certainly hundreds, if not thousands, of Soviet intelligence agents running around uh, Berlin. Peter's unit is consists of nine guys, and he's heading it, and he's just turned 24. So it, it, you know, just there in a nutshell, just tells you how how completely ill-equipped the Americans were of what was coming. So what you start seeing is guys like Peter and other people in the field. They're they're reporting back to Washington. Hey, the the, the Soviets are taking over all these countries. They're they're undermining the the, the, the political parties. Um, they're using all these strong arm tactics. And it, it, for this crucial period. Uh, it, it's like Washington just didn't want to hear it or, or, or it couldn't figure out how to counteract it anyway. Because again, uh, we're demobilizing our military at this incredible rate. So one of the things that Sichel gets up to in Berlin is uh, sort of making connections with, with a bunch of former Nazis. And, and in at least, at least one big example, but, but I think others as well, making deals with them and, and using their sort of expertise and their contacts. Um, to to further their own sort of intelligence operations. Can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, this is an area where there's a lot of sort of general awareness of it, I think. But but you have some real um, real sort of specific cases uh, in the right. in the book of sort of uh, collaborating with ex Nazis. Yeah, there's there's this kind of gradual process of the the the, the use of the Nazis in the post war era. If they were first. You know, basically Germany was prostrate at the end of the war, and and the Americans first came in with this idea that anybody had served, who had served in any role who had been a member of the Nazi Party was now going to be effectively banned. Essentially, what what George George Bush uh, did in Iraq of of debathification of, of of Iraq very quickly turned unworkable because you know any anybody who had who was running anything in in Nazi Germany were members of the Nazi Party. So very quickly. Right. They start working with, you know, with, with former Nazi uh, Party members, 
that became especially true with intelligence because to find out what was happening in Eastern Europe, the Americans had nobody during the war uh, who, was, who was aware of what was happening in the Soviet Union or in Eastern Europe. So they start using these former German military intelligence officers. And then it just kind of becomes this gradual process that, you know, first you're using them just for analysis, but then you're using them for operations um, to the point where, um, the, the CIA inherited a bunch of these guys from the Army Counterintelligence Corps. Um, and now you're all of a sudden you're dealing with, with some really bona fide, you know, really creepy characters that and you guys wanted for war crimes. Uh, in, the, in the particular case of Peter Suchel, um, and, and this is what's kind of interesting in this, is that Peter was actually uh, from a German Jewish family. His family had fled in the mid 1930s when, when Hitler came to power. They got to the States. And so, because Hitler, because Sichel was obviously a fluent German speaker, it's one of the reasons he was being put in, into Berlin. Um, so, here is a, and then uh, one thing Peter told me, uh, he's still alive, and, and I did, did a series of interviews with him. Um, he said, you know, whenever I would try to recruit a German, they always wanted to have, quote, the conversation with me. And that conversation being, you know, I was always against Hitler. You know, I, I hid Jews in my basement. And, <laughs> and Peter, Peter said, as soon as we would start in, I would say, stop. I don't, I don't want to hear, hear it. What, what you did during the war is between you and your conscience. Uh, from, you know, from now on, you, I just want you to be on our side and be a good German. So he had this kind of amazing ability to sort of put out of his mind the, the past of these people, which is probably what made him such a good spy master. Um, but it also set him on this path where, um, in one, one uh, particularly notorious Nazi war criminal, he helped, he basically helped come up with this false identity to help him get out of Germany and the United States. And this man, his name was Otto von Bolschwing, ended up, in a, you know, 40 years later, being uh, investigated by the Office of Special Investigations of the Justice Department for Nazi war crimes. 40 years later, after, after living in the United States. That's right. He was in the States for about 40 years. Uh, stripped of his citizenship, he was about to be deported when he, when he died of, of brain cancer. Um, but uh, really, uh, this guy was really a, a nasty piece of work. And um, I had this interview with, with Peter where I was talking about the use of, of Nazis and, and I, I kind of reached up to the point where I wanted to ask him specifically about this yeah. kind of von Bolschwein, because I had Peter's name on documents that, that, you know, kind of helping hide this guy's identity from, from Nazi war hunter, uh, you know, Nazi war crime hunters. Um, and I just kind of couldn't bring myself to, to kind of pin him to it. You know, here's a 97 year old man, very easy for us or for me 70 years later to kind of stand in judgment of, of what these guys, the situation that they were in. Um, and there was, this, uh, there was this moment where Peter absolutely knew where, where I was going. And he, he, and he just said, you know, back then I did things that I wouldn't do now. I believed in things that I don't believe now. Um, and they said, that's it. <laughs> so you let, you let it go there. You didn't, you didn't press him any further. I, I just, you know, it, it's one of my, it's one of my failings as a journalist. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we're trained to like, you know, that's, that's the little, that's the niche you just, you drive, you drive your stiletto in and you, and you see what happens. And, but I guess, you know, my, my sense of just being a decent person that kind of won out. I mean, here's a, here's a 97 year old man who obviously has lived with this uh, in some form on, a, on his conscience all these years. And he has created a narrative for himself to kind of explain it. And it's like, you know, who and, am I? And in a sense, there, 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 there's, not a, there's not a mystery about it. You had the documents, you knew what he did. So yeah. there, wasn't, there wasn't a piece of information that was missing. No. You know, no. right. No, and I think, you know, I mean, you know, if you're in this, you know, when when you're talking about spy war, spy wars, you get into bed with some pretty unsavory characters all all the time. And it's, I mean, I think that this is one of the kind of moral things that that eventually eats away at people is that there's this political expedience that you have to go along with it. That and at a certain point, maybe you reach a point where you just can't do it anymore. But you're always thinking about, you know, it's it's the ultimate end justifies the means. Right. 
Now in Berlin in the sort of mid and late forties, uh, Sechelle has his sort of nine men. He's running these ops. He's trying to recruit sort of double agents and and sources and spies with on the on the sort of Soviet side of things. And reading your book, uh, I'm struck by just how it just feels like one colossal blunder or failure after another. I mean, they're just all their little networks getting rolled up, you know, where they think they're getting stuff, but actually everybody's a double agent, and they're, you know, it's it's. What are what are the success stories that they built the great tradition of the American intelligence operation on? <laughs> what, what what were the moments where they're like, oh, finally we got this one, we got this one right? Right. I, I mean, very very few and far between, and you know, certainly in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe was just kind of a, a you know an unmitigated disaster. Um, one thing that you you, you mentioned about the the. There's, it was in 1946, so Peter had just been in, Peter Sichel had just been in Berlin for a year. They were trying to get a sense, what's called an order of battle. They were trying to find out just how militarily prepared the Soviet Red Army was in Eastern Germany. Uh, you know, did they have like offensive plans? So they rolled out these huge chains of agents all through, agents and sub-agents uh, throughout Eastern Germany, East Berlin. And they thought they were getting great material. And then literally in a 48 hour period, all their chains disappeared. The, the, the Soviets had been watching them all along. Everybody, everybody got pulled up. And this, this was kind of a pattern. It, it, you know, also, with when they were doing these, these uh, com commando operations behind the Iron Curtain of dropping anti-communist partisans behind the lines, the Soviets saw, in, in some cases, they were, they, these, these anti-communist emigre groups were so infiltrated by the, by the Soviets that they, that they were waiting for them on the ground when these guys parachuted in. And, and almost all these operations were, were just uh, complete disasters. Um, probably a bit more successful in Asia, um, uh, that, certainly than, than in Eastern Europe. But what you saw time and again was, it was the whole culture of secrecy in the, in, in the Soviet Union in particular, but in the communist world in general, the CIA was just caught completely flat footed. Never saw, you know, never saw the North Korean invasion of South Korea coming in 1950. Um, thought that the, the Soviets were still like three, three years away from develop, developing an atomic bomb when they actually got it. Um, and one thing that stunned me, uh, I just had no, no clue of this. The CIA had nobody, uh, they had no informant anywhere inside this, the Soviet hierarchy uh, around Stalin. Uh, and, and not even like, you know, a fifth tier bureaucrat in the Ministry of Agriculture. I mean, nobody, let alone, you know, someone close to the Kremlin who could, could kind of gauge what might be coming next. So they really were operating in the dark. And meanwhile, the Soviets uh, had, had um, I mean, the, the head of, no, I guess he wasn't the head, but, but uh, I'm forgetting his first name, Philby. Um, oh, Kim, Kim Philby, yeah. Kim Philby was, was I, I mean, in on, in on some of the most confidential uh, U.S. operations too. I mean, he was he was um, uh, and he, he he was a Soviet agent. So it's it does seem like incredible disproportionate. Um, incredibly disproportionate. Him. Yeah, Kim Philby. He was the uh, the British intelligence liaison to the American intelligence. So he was in this. He was based in Washington during this really critical period, and he had access to everything. Uh, he had. Uh, you know, he, he had the minutes of the top secret conversations going on between the American and British heads of state. Uh, knew all about the, the, the nuclear programs that, that were being developed. The interesting thing with Philby is when all these operations, he got unmasked finally in, in the early 1950s, he kind of became the dumping ground for the, the, these anti-communist anti commando operations that, that had been going all th through Eastern Europe that had all been disasters. When Philby was unmasked, all the, all these failures kind of got dumped on him. Um, right, it's all his fault. Right. When, it, when in actual fact, or certainly the probability is that he was so high up, the Soviets were not using him for these these to 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 report on these commando operations going. They had those already wrapped up. I mean, they right. used him for this very high end stuff, you know, between between Truman and and the you know, the, the British Prime Minister. It seems almost crazy to, to ask the question this way, but what would have been different if, like, the United States had done almost nothing? I mean, it it, it does seem that the that the 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 uh, it, it it's like a net negative 
their influence on the sort of course of events. Um, and if, if in, in addition to sort of pulling back militarily, we just like pulled, you know, or not developed our intelligence apparatus the way we did, what, what would have been different? What? You know, it's, it's, it's a great question. I'll answer in two ways. One, what, what you do see in the early post-war period is, for instance, like in Italy in 1948, they're having elections. It looked like actually the Communist Party of Italy might win and, and then might take Italy into the Soviet orbit. Uh, the CIA uh, launched this massive uh, subterranean funding of the Social Democrats and Christian Democrats and managed to kind of defeat the communists at the ballot box. Similarly, there, you know, probably in, in the Communist Party at one time in France was really powerful. So there may have been this kind of defensive capability that they had you know, during the containment policy that may have had, a, 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 I mean, from our vantage point, a positive influence in, in, what, in Western Europe. Um, but yeah, but by and large, uh, not much. The, the, the other great irony with the CIA of all these different, there was this whole gamut of, of, of uh, programs the CIA was running from the 1940s through the 1960s, everything from you know, kind of hard power of overthrowing governments, but also the soft power of, of uh, Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, these cultural programs that they were operating all through uh, Western Europe in the 40s and 50s. Overseas Library Program, which was, which was a CIA operation funneled through the State Department. It was literally just setting up these massive libraries, uh, you know, all through Western Europe where, you know, people could come in off the street and, and, you know, check out books and stuff. Those were probably the most effective. I mean, this is a great irony. <laughs> it's got libraries that were more effective than bombs to, in, in this idea of spreading you know, kind of American cultural and, and, and cultural going to political influence around the world. And certainly more effective than spies, too. I mean, not just the bombs, yeah, exactly. but the, um, uh, what's the biggest, uh, in the course of your reporting, what's a, what, did you, what did you learn that was sort of about the, the nature of, of uh, intelligence and U.S. intelligence, in particular, that changed your mind. Like, were there any sort of preconceptions you had, or or basic understandings that were proven wrong, or at least substantially different by by the stories you un unearthed? Probably the biggest takeaway I came f away with was I had no idea just this this almost daily onslaught of events from the end of World War II, uh, uh, you know, certainly through the rest of the 1940s. Virtually, I mean, not every day, but every third day, <laughs> to be honest, some kind of cataclysmic thing was happening around the world. And um, I think Amer America just didn't know how to kind of respond. They were, they were really overwhelmed by events. You know, America, you remember America was still a very isolationist country, you know, even through World War II. So if, if something's happening in, in West Africa, um, you know, there's very few people even in the State Department who can find that country on a map. Um, so I th there, there, there was this thing of, of being o just overwhelmed by events. And I think also, I, I w as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I was stunned at the, the lack of, of awareness of what they had, the knowledge they had of what was happening inside the Soviet Union. I can now understand better why these guys were, you know, couldn't sleep at night of wondering what was coming next. Because on the other side of that Iron Curtain, at least until 1953, you have a guy like Stalin, who's essentially a paranoid sociopath and you don't know what he's capable of doing next or even what he's thinking of doing next. So I, I, I think I have a new appreciation for just how in the dark and what a, what a scary time this must have been for people. Now you present in the sort of early days of Khrushchev's uh, reign, I guess is the right word. Um, there's sort of a critical moment in Hungary where, where uh, um, uh, the Soviets clamped down hard on the on the sort of the, 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 the sort of nascent rebellion there, and there's kind of an opportunity for uh, the American government to respond and to to uh, to respond with strength, and then they don't. Can you can you talk about that a little bit and why that's such a why that's such a big moment? Um, is that 1955? 56. In yeah, 56. 56. Right. Yeah. Okay. So just to back up a little bit on that, where I and where the subtitle comes from, a tragedy in three acts. The third act of this tragedy 
being when the Eisenhower administration comes in and John Foster Dulles is the Secretary of State and he's this ultra right wing, you know, hardcore ideologue who has this notion that you, you know, any, any sign of, any sign of rapprochement coming from, from Moscow is a sign, it's either a sign of their duplicity or a sign of their weakness or both at the same time. So how, whatever Khrushchev does, um, if it's a, if it's an aggressive act, if it's, if it's, if it's a olive branch, he's, he's, you know, offering, uh, you resist it, you fight back. Uh, so, and this is also the period, of course, when it, it, the Americans overthrow the democratic government in Iran, then in Guatemala, these were both uh, you know, in the early years of, of Eisenhower. Meanwhile, the Eisenhower administration is just continuing with this propaganda of, of, of they're going to roll back communism. They're going to liberate the, you know, the so-called captive nations of Eastern Europe. And this this constant drumbeat of, of liberation. Um, so then what happens in Hungary in, in, uh, in, in October of 1956 is there actually is a spontaneous anti-communist uprising. Um, again, CIA never saw it coming. Uh, it certainly did, not, certainly did not have a hand in, in provoking it. Um, and it just blows up literally overnight. And um, it reaches a point where after about seven days into the revolution where Khrushchev and the Politburo uh, decide, you know, we have to, we have to pull out. We, we, the only way to put this down is by, by force and, and we can't do that. So on this critical meeting of the Politburo, October 31st, 1956, Khrushchev says we're, we're pulling out. He has a very sleepless night. <laughs> he gets up the next morning and thinks, you know what? We don't have to give up Hungary because if the Americans were going to do something, they would have done it by now. The Americans aren't going to, aren't going to come in to help them. Um, so the very next day, Khrushchev ordered the tanks to turn around and go back into Budapest, the capital, and, and the revolution was crushed. So the, the American, the Eisenhower administration played this really cynical game of having done, you know, constantly stoked up the, the idea that, that, that there's going to be rebellion. Um, we're going to come to your aid. And then when it happens, they go, oh, you know, sorry, you're on your own. And I, I interviewed, he, he's since died, but one of the last... American journalist uh, who was who was in Budapest uh, during the revolution, a guy named uh, uh, Timothy Foote. He describes this awful moment. It was in the last day of the revolution where the the Soviet tanks have come back in and they're, they've pushed the, the rebels or the freedom fighters uh, into this tiny pocket in downtown Budapest. And he and he was there, and all of a sudden he hears people cheering, and and uh, you know it really happened cheering. And he turns to a, a fighter. He's he's in a, he's in an apartment building. Next to me, and he says, well, you know, what's going on? He says, oh, we just heard the Americans have come across the border. You know, the Americans are on their way to, to, to help us. And of course it wasn't true. And so, you know, within a few hours, all those people were, you know, were either killed or, or captured. Um, How so, close do you think the Americans were to, to actually putting troops on the ground or sending in airplanes? I mean, was it, was it touch and go or was it just never really on the table? No, you see the other thing, well, when Eisenhower came in, he initiated this, and, and this this is kind of a central core idea to the book, is that when when Eisenhower came in, he established this thing called the New Look Doctrine. And the New Look Doctrine was basically that the United States reserved the right to, to massively retaliate if they felt its national, its foreign if it's vital foreign policy interests are at stake. So basically that was a euphemism for a nuclear first strike that America now reserve the right and never instated before, but we reserve the right to do a nuclear first strike. So of course the Soviets immediately came out and, and said, <laughs> said the same thing. On their own right. side. What nobody kind of put together. I mean, I, it's astonishing. I, I, I just found no documentation of people looking at the new look doctrine that anyone kind of put this together. It did two things simultaneously. Number one, it, it's, it locked into place the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe. The Soviets now could never you know, invade Germany um, because that was to, you know, vital to our national security interests. So it would invite a nuclear first strike. Likewise, the Americans couldn't go into Hungary because that was in the Soviets' you know, strategic sphere. So th and then the other thing that Nulik did was that having solidified into place East Europe, it opened up the entire rest of the world as the playground for, because now you could now you could create mischief in all these other countries that were not 
you know, of the vital strategic interest to either superpower. So it had the effect simultaneously of locking Europe into place and opening up the whole rest of the world to the Cold War. Um, so this brings us to Vietnam and to- That's right, uh, that's right. And so I think, you know, what happened when Hungary blew up is Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles and his closest advisors sat there and thought, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, we've, we've done everything possible to promote exactly this thing to happen. But if we do anything about it now, we're, to, we're going to be flirting with a nuclear war. So they just like wash their heads. Wow. Um, at one point, you described the CIA as the ultimate fall guy. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, you know, if you asked me earlier if there was anything that kind of surprised me, I'd, I'd say one yeah. thing that really did surprise me is that, in, in, not just in the time period I'm looking at, this 12 year period, but kind of going through the CIA's history all, you know, up to the present day, um, there's this idea of the agency being this, this, this kind of rogue operation at, at different key moments in, in its history, uh, you know, that, that operates on its own. And this is an idea that our current president is actively promoting. But in fact, the, the agency always operated with the tacit, at least the tacit uh, approval, uh, if not the instigation of the American president. So if you look at almost any, certainly any major operation throughout the agency's history, um, it, was all, it was all done at the behest of, of the sitting American president. Um, but it, within the CIA's doctrine is this doctrine of plausible deniability. So, so one of their whole reasons for being is to take the blame. So if, if, if you know, Bay of Pigs, for example, blows up and it's a big fiasco, well, it's the CIA's fiasco. It's not John F. Kennedy's fiasco. And, the, and this has been, you know, um, WMDs in Iraq in, in 2003. Uh, the, the Bush administration did everything possible to, to push the agency to find the, the, the existence of WMDs. It, it, in fact, within the agency, there's a huge debate going on whether they actually existed or not. Of course, they weren't there didn't exist, but you know, who, takes, who takes the fall for it? It's, oh, the, you know, the agency let us down. That is the agency's role, uh, is, to, is to take blame. One of the things that struck me about your, your four characters is that sort of each of them comes across you know, as sort of a decent person, you know, not, a, not, a, not a villain, not a fool, not a, not a sort of power-hungry madman, and yet, their legacy is is sort of astonishingly um i mean i guess it's just depressing i mean the 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 um these very talented very in most cases very real, well educated i mean the, they were sort of the for the the term that's used later the best brightest and they spend their you know entire careers um you know ultimately uh you know, sort of betraying of America's better values. Um, it, it's 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 kind of sober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, and I think it's one of the reasons why. Um, well, one of them committed suicide, um, uh, and then and two of them quit. Two of them quit the CIA, and I, I think it was seeing in one case of the two men who who quit. One was just seeing the utter futility on the ground of the of the operations he was involved in. There's a guy who was. Uh, kind of orchestrating the, 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 the you know, the dropping of, of guerrillas behind uh, the Iron Curtain. Uh, just saw hundreds of, of people just, you know, parachute to their deaths. Uh, in the case of Peter Sichel, he, um, he, the reason he quit or kind of reached his breaking point is that he had seen all these operations be such disasters in, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, he, he, went, he was the CIA station chief in Hong Kong in 1960. Uh, right when East Asia is starting to kind of perk up. Uh, he was at a meeting of CIA station chiefs in, in the Philippines where the new number two guy of the CIA, the head of covert operations, comes out and he goes, hey, we're, we're launching a new, you know, a new operation. We're going to be dropping anti-communist Chinese <laughs> into in Mao's China. That's going to be a $100 million operation. We're going to be, you know, be dropping uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of guys behind the lines. And during a break in this conference, Peter took this, uh, the, the number two guy aside and said, you know, we, we save so much time and money if we just kill them ourselves. He said, this is going to be a disaster just like it was in Eastern Europe. And then he said, I'm out. I'm, I quit. And, he, and he, he quit the agency just like right there. Um, so I think, yeah, they all, they all kind of reached. And they also ran afoul of the, um, sorry. No, no. 
No, I was just going to say, I think, you know, individually they kind of reach points where they, they, they either broke or they, you know, you just keep going, going along with it. So they, they also had problems sort of domestically, politically in the United States with, particularly with McCarthy and the, and the Red Scare, maybe, maybe you could describe a little bit of some of those details, because that was another stunning part of the book. The, you know, these guys are out there in the field, um, you know, sort of overmatched and, and undermanned and, right. um, and then, and then meanwhile, they're, they're, you know, being called traitors back at home. Right. Um, uh, by, by McCarthy, by some of the other, by some of his allies. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this, I, this, I, this was a huge uh, influence on all the, all, all four of them. All four of these men, and, and this is very true of the early CIA. It, it, they, it, the particular men I didn't, I wrote, write about only one of them was really kind of in an Ivy League, but they tended to draw very heavily from the Ivy League. Most early CIA officers were, were politically liberal, certainly very socially liberal. Um, and certainly all four of them in I write about and, and throughout the CIA of other people, I you know, saw things they had written from the time. To a man uh, appalled by the, the Red Scare that was, you know, that was promoted by Joe McCarthy uh, starting in 1950, and, and really, McCarthy was kind of the front man for J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was the, was the guy who was funneling these, these confidential files to McCarthy, who would then come out with them publicly. Um, so they, and, and they saw the effect that the, the Red Scare, the, which was really a witch hunt, um, what that, the effect that was having on, on American standing, moral standing, and prestige abroad, certainly, and especially maybe in, in Europe. You know, Europeans, Western Europeans, just like, you know, what are Americans doing? And on a personal level, two of the four guys I'm, I'm writing about, both Peter Sichel being one of them, um, were both investigated by the FBI as potential communist spies. Uh, and the, the, the great irony is, in, in Peter's case, is that he had, he'd seen so many of these commando operations be so disastrous. He had started sh shutting these operations down. Uh, because it was just, you know, it was, it was mass suicide, essentially sending these people over. Uh, the, the CIA officers in the field who, who were wanting to push these programs and were and they were really getting shut down by, you know, still started sending, you know, it's like, well, why does this guy, you know, keep closing down our operations that I know this time is going to work. <laughs> you know? right. uh, so the fact that he was shutting down so many of these disastrous operations was what, made him fall under suspicion as a potential right. king of mole. As we're talking, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's September 10th. Uh, the president of the United States has been in the news quite a bit, as he always is. Uh, <laughs> uh, and one of the things that's been, been front and center is, is some of his comments about the military. And, and uh, in the discussion of that, people say, well, you know, he's lost the military and, you know, he previously lost the intelligence community. That's like a, just a sort of a talking point that people uh that, that, that's out there what do you think that means that the president has lost the intelligence community and and uh, do you agree with that and and what would the consequences of that be um the president being having lost the intelligence community yeah oh, we've we've never we've never been in the situation before um you know one thing certainly people i've talked to within the agency in the last few years um they see Putin's Russia as as an inherently adversarial nation to the, to the United States. We, we are not we're not friends. We are not. We're certainly not allies. We, it is an inherently adversarial relationship. Um, I think that they are every everybody I've ever talked to in the agency. They are both deeply alarmed and deeply suspicious uh, of why we have a president who, who, who steadfastly refuses to acknowledge that. You know, the, Trump's talk about oh, the deep state conspiracy, uh, that doesn't really bother them. I, I think they know that's kind of politics and this is, it's, it's posturing, but definitely what, what really worries them uh, to a man and to a woman um, is, is this utter refusal to recognize what, the, the fundamental relationship is between uh, you know, the United States and Russia, and we're, we see it we see it acted out virtually daily. Uh, you know, the fact that the American president has not come out and said anything about the, the, the attempted murder of, of Navalny, 
uh, you know, two weeks ago. The, you know, poisoning that was clearly carried out by the, the Russian secret police. Um, you know, how can an American president, you know, not respond to that? But he hasn't responded to it, to any of the other stuff, uh, including the, the, you know, the fact that the Russians were giving bounties to, to Taliban fighters to kill Americans. <laughs> how can an American president not talk about that? Um, it's, it's, so that's pretty astonishing. Does, does all of this feel kind of fixable to you? I mean, is this, is this one of those, I mean, that's, I think that's the big question around uh, that people have around around Trump is that you know four years of of kind of uh, weakening of American institutions and capabilities um, is it is it is it something that can be turned around by a by a different president fairly quickly is it is there is there long term damage uh, what's your what's your sense on that um, I think some of it can be turned around very quickly you know and I'm, I'm reminded of when Obama came in. Uh, you know, and t took over from Bush. I mean, if, if you remember, you know, Bush was pretty universally despised, it's certainly in Europe by the time he was gone. And so Obama comes in and, and he's a rock star. You know, the Europeans love him. I think he had higher approval ratings in Europe than he had in the States. So I think a lot, you know, there's a lot of the world out there that is waiting to, to America to, to from their vantage point, you know, to, to kind of get their act together and, and to come back to what it once was and, and to renew NATO, to, 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 to be supportive of the European Union instead of trying to, you know, do everything possible to dismantle it, to, to return to that, the, the kind of adversarial relationship with Russia. On a long-term basis, though, I think that what is deeply corrosive about this administration is, uh, in the eyes of other people around the world is like that. Well, the Americans elected somebody like Trump once. What's going to prevent them from electing somebody like him again? Um, and what I what and on a large level, this even kind of transcends Trump. But I think one thing that Americans, you know, all around the world, the view the view that people have of America in general as a, as a power is that you can wait them out. You you know all, all you you just play beat the clock with the Americans and eventually they're going to get tired and go home and and you know uh, certainly that was Stalin's idea in 1945. It's like the Americans are going to pack up and go home and, and they're going to leave the the, the playing field does. Uh, we're about to see it play out in, in Afghanistan. Um, you know it's I mean it's it's in the works. You know Americans just like we did in Vietnam. Uh, we're looking for a you know quote decent interval so that we can kind of say oh our job here is done we're going to leave. And then hopefully there's a decent interval before the whole thing goes down the toilet. And that's, that's the all the American It's been policy. 20 years in Afghanistan though. I mean, that is a. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. A pretty, that's true. But it's been, you know, road. That, that has been, and, and, but it's been very, and it's, it's probably, a, a, you know, and as, as was Vietnam, we seem to do one or the other. We, we either like, you know, like go in very quickly and pull out and then, and then they're stunned that the whole thing falls apart or yeah, we, we, or we stay in forever and, and can't figure out how to get out. But, but certainly the, you know, the so-called American solution in Afghanistan is going to look almost exactly like the solution in Vietnam. Since you do know a lot about Afghanistan, what, I guess I'm confused. I, I understand, I feel fairly well why uh, uh, Obama uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, close Gitmo. Like I, 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 I don't agree with it, but I understand it. I, I'm not sure I do understand why Trump doesn't have the troops out of Afghanistan. Um, I think it's, he doesn't want the embarrassment on his watch of watching the Taliban take over. Um, you know, I, the, the, the awful thing of Afghanistan is after all the deaths, all the destruction, we're going to end up you know, right back where we were almost 20 years ago um, once the Americans you know, pull out altogether. Um, I, you know, I, I give it a matter of months before the Taliban takes over. And then, and then, uh, it, then you potentially have another you know, so-called rogue state in, in, you know, in the middle of Central Asia that could, that it, because when we, when we leave, we're going to leave completely. We're not going to have eyes and ears on the ground. And so, you know, the idea of a, another Al-Qaeda or, or ISIS coming along and using Afghanistan as a base, it's, it's a distinct possibility. Right. Um, so I would, from reading your book, I would say that the, uh, the influence of the CIA on world events generally is hugely overrated. Um, I would say that's a conclusion of your book. 
correct me if I'm wrong. What do you think about the CIA is underrated? Like, what do we not, uh, what are their capabilities or their aims or things that we, we may not appreciate enough or know enough about? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really good question. Kennedy had this, this said, you know, the thing about intelligence agencies is that their, their failures are very public and their successes are unknown. And I think that that's largely true uh, with the CIA. Is, is if, if something is successful, you just never really hear about it. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think that they've probably been fairly effective in certain places, again, certain places in Asia, certainly in Africa. Um, but it's, it, I'm kind of hard, you know, hard pressed to say what, like to point to something on a major level. Well, again, you know, this goes, this goes <laughs> way back. Presumably they've had a success, you know, before this, but, um, you know, I, I mentioned the Italian elections in 1948, that, that it, it, was this, it was this very comprehensive program designed to neutralize the, the legal, legal communist party. America had a doctrine, we don't interfere in the elections of, of other democracies. That went by the wayside in, in 48, as, as, ha as it has in other countries since. You know, and I, was, I was thinking, you know, the countries I grew up in, Taiwan and South Korea, which had a huge, uh, both American military and uh, American intelligence uh, involvement, uh, you know, th certainly throughout the 60s and 70s, kind of success stories, but is it a success you can, you know, they're, they're both functioning democracies now, but is that something, I've never had the sense that, that was something that the CIA or the American government you know, actively pushed those, those countries to do. I mean, it, it came about, I think, much more organically. Um, so long, long, long way around to your, to your question, I think the answer is you, you often just don't know what, <laughs> where they've been successful. So we're, so we're back to where we started from, in a sense. Maybe the influence on world events is not, right. not related. Exactly. Um, right. um, uh, so I want to I close by asking for a recommendation. First of all, I want to make sure I, I give a, a, a recommendation in terms of your book, because I think what's, what's really truly wonderful about it is it, it, it has a, it's, it's very much engaged in, 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 uh, in, in the nitty gritty and the history of, of, of the United States in the mid-century. Um, but it's also just a really sort of excellent kind of adventure story with, with a lot of different um, characters and, and a lot of really cool areas of the world. And, and it's just an exciting reading experience. So I want to make sure people um, know that too. This is not, this is not, Scott does not press your, you know, nose up against all these depressing facts and force <laughs> you to acknowledge them. It's, it's, it's really a, it's, it's really a very, uh, really pleasurable reading experience. But I want to ask you for a recommendation. Um, I, I guess personally, what I would most want to know is, is there a great spy novel that you love? And you, 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 I'm going to ask you not to pick one of the obvious ones. Um, I might even have to take John Le Carre off the table. Um, but is there, is there a work of fiction or nonfiction um, that you think gets aspects of this world right or that you just think is something people should, uh, should read? You know, one of my all-time favorite books, I, I suppose it's a spy book, is Our Man in Havana. Um, okay. by Graham Greene. It's just, it, of course, Graham Greene was, he was an intelligence officer, uh, um, but it really gets to, it's just a wonderful book. It's a, it's a, it's funny, um, but it, funny in a very acerbic, <laughs> uh, dark way. Uh, and it, it, it I, not to give anything away about it, but it basically a, a, a guy starts cooking information that he's sending back to London, uh, uh, to basically raise money and any kind of he, the, the more information he sends, the more it becomes this is kind of you know vital national security concern of what's happening in Havana. It's, it is, and it, it does get to something about the absurdity of that whole this the spy world and how things how information can be manufactured. Um, uh, yeah, that's and I but I, from a from a more realistic standpoint, uh, I even though you took him off the table, I have to say Lucare. Lucare <laughs> really does again another former intelligence officer, but there, this the 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 sadness the the uh, and the solitude of being a spy, being a double agent, be, having a secret life, and, and as alienating as that is, it's, it sounds very cool when you're on the outside. But you know, you're, you're, it creates a distance between you and everyone around you, including your own family. And I, I Lacare really gets that. Um, uh, is there one? Is there one that, that that stands out in your mind as a as a personal favorite? 
Um, probably Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, I, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, you really um well, I I mean I have to agree, but uh but uh it's it's uh if you haven't read it yet, you really you really yeah. you have to read Scott's book first, but then you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Scott, thanks a lot. This has been this has been a, this has been this has been really a lot of fun and uh appreciate you joining us. This has been the Intelligence Squared podcast with Scott Anderson. He is the author of The Quiet Americans, um a new book about the American intelligence uh the history of the American intelligence sort of apparatus it's, it's a terrific book and uh, uh thank you very much scott i really appreciate it thanks so much Hugh. i really appreciate it Bye. -bye.